I'm particularly delighted to uh, introduce to you uh, the Reverend Dr. Fred Geiser. Uh, it was not actually an accident that I invited him, though he may wonder how I got his name. Uh, back in 2005, my son and I were living in the Mission Apartments uh, right there on the Luther campus, and I heard Dr. Geiser preach. Uh, I actually heard him do a sermon uh, from a vantage point that I think is particularly difficult, and he did it with such grace, I thought I have to hear this man some more. Uh, he did a first person, uh, God in the first person sermon. Now that's a very difficult thing to pull off <laughs> without sounding arrogant. <laughs> and he did it very, very well, and I was intrigued. Uh, so when uh, we started thinking about who could we ask to come and be our speaker this year, uh, he came to mind. Fred Geiser came to Luther Seminary as a lecturer in Old Testament in 1973 and was promoted to professor in 1991. Uh, he has served as director of graduate studies and acting dean of students and as registrar. As political and economic conditions allow, he directs Luther Seminary's program in Zimbabwe. Uh, he didn't come to uh, theology by the normal route. Uh, he's uh, trained as a chemist and worked with Upjohn Pharmaceuticals in Kalamazoo, Michigan uh, for at least one year before hearing the call, was ordained in 19, uh, was interim pastor in, at Emanuel Lutheran Church in Warren, Ohio in 1963, ordained in 69, uh, served St. Paul's in Humboldt, South Dakota, not too far to our south. Uh, he also uh, taught for a while uh, while there at Augustana in Sioux Falls. He currently serves as editor of Word and World, Theology for Christian Ministry, the seminary's quarterly uh, uh, journal. He's an editor uh, and author for EnterTheBible.org and a frequent contributor to WorkingPreacher.org. Uh, he has served on the Inter-Lutheran Task Force on Occasional Services, the Inter-Lutheran Commission on Worship, the ELCA Task Force on Health and Healthcare, and is a member of the Society for Biblical Literature. Uh, a graduate of Kalamazoo College, and, um, and also of what is now Trinity Seminary in Columbus, Ohio, he earned his Doctor of Theology degree from the University of Heidelberg uh, in 1985. Uh, Dr. Geiser has edited five published volumes, including most recently, Rethinking Stewardship, and he's translated for, publica for the publication Yahweh, the Patriarch, and the Song of Songs. His book, Healing in the Bible, Theological Insight for Christian Ministry was published in 2010. Uh, I specifically asked Dr. Geiser to address us uh, on issues around authority in scripture because that's what we're wrestling with. So I'm delighted to welcome and uh, introduce to you uh, Dr. Frederick Geisel. Thank you. I trust I'm supposed to use this, is that correct? Yes, please. <clears throat> the overall title for this series of three lectures is By What Authority? As you recognize, that title comes from Jesus' encounter with the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders in Mark 11. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked Jesus. Oh, did we have the handouts? Uh, the handouts are simply to give you something of a line of direction and the uh, and the, some of the citations that I will use so you know where it came from. Um, so, Mark 11, by what authority are you doing these things? They asked Jesus, where these things in the gospel seems to include everything from Jesus' healing and teaching to his forgiving of sins and the cleansing of the temple by what authority? Since 
we readers of the Gospel of Mark have met these questioners before, we know that this is a gotcha question, not an inquiry seeking genuine insight. The powers that be hope that he will say something wrong, or whatever he says will be wrong, and it may even convict him of blasphemy. As readers of the Gospel, we know something that the inquisitors did not, that the authority rides, resides in Jesus himself. Earlier in Mark's Gospel, we hear the crowd's amazement that Jesus speaks as one having authority. And it says precisely not as one of the scribes, that is, the guys who are now questioning Jesus about authority. Jesus speaks as one having authority. A lot resides in that observation. The scribes were exegetes. <clears throat> Not a bad job. But they were exegetes and teachers of God's word once delivered. Whereas the one having authority speaks God's word directly and anew. That someone speaks with authority means that for Israel in that time, the long dry spell was over, the period in which prophecy seemed dead, and the exegesis and retelling of ancient stories was the best that God's people could expect. No longer, says Mark. The new reign of the Spirit was falling on the parched land of Palestine. A new word was being spoken. A new age was dawning. And all of that resides in Jesus of Nazareth. The story about the scribes and the elders asking Jesus about authority, the source of his authority, is equivalent to Pilate's question of Jesus, what is truth? God's own truth stood before Pilate. God's own authority stood before the elders, but neither Pilate nor the priests had eyes to see. I start these lectures here, and I could end here and sit down. All of our responses to questions about the biblical authority or the authority of the word of God must begin and end with Jesus. By what authority? Jesus is the authority and that in the New Testament and in Christian teaching and that changes everything. With the New Testament, Lutherans insist on that, which makes our view of authority and scripture somewhat different than that of other Christian traditions. It's why we're not fundamentalists nor classic liberals, neither Pentecostals nor Quakers. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ, but Lutherans have a unique witness to bear regarding the question of authority, and we should do that boldly. One more thing, though, about Jesus' encounter with the priests, the scribes, and the elders. Quickly, Jesus quickly recognized that he is in a game of gotcha, so he responds with a gotcha question of his own. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? Now the elders are on the spot, hoisted on their own petard, because whatever they say will bring them trouble. If they say it was, came from heaven, then why aren't they followers of John? And if they say it was not, then the whole crowd who thought it was from heaven will be on their necks. So they decline to answer. And interestingly, as the text says, Jesus declines to answer them. We can learn something from this, I think. First, don't play gotcha games with Jesus since you're destined to lose. <laughs> but even more important, gotcha questions go nowhere. 
they yield no productive results, not even when Jesus is one of the partners in the conversation. Gotcha questions hardly went away with the scribes and the elders. The litmus test questions about the Bible or the authority of the Word of God, questions designed to trap or test the other, according to some imposed and predetermined criteria. You may have noticed that such questions remain alive and well among us, but they are a dead-end street that God's people should avoid like dark alleys in an unknown town city. They lead to death, because when we play gotcha games with the Bible, the Bible ceases to be Bible, even as we quote it. In Lutheran teaching, as my former colleague Jean Fievel wrote, the Bible is to be used for the purpose for which it was given to us by God, that is, to point to the good news of salvation by grace through faith in Christ. And I would up the ante on Fievel's statement by saying again that apart from that, that appropriate use, the Bible is not Bible, at least as the, at least not Bible as, the, as authoritative scripture. It's just words on a plate. It's just words on a page. So play whatever games with it you want. 19th century preacher George MacDonald put it this way, also quite sharply, but appropriately so, when he was talking about the misuse of the written word for what he called word worship false logic and corruption of the truth, he wrote, seeing it could not give life, the letter should not be thrown with the power to kill. It should be but, it should be but the handmaid to open the door of the truth to the mind that was of the truth. So if I leave you with nothing else from these lectures, I hope you will hear this. It's time for Lutherans to quit playing offense and defense with regard to issues of authority. Playing offense <laughs> against one another, I believe more of the Bible than you do, or, def <laughs> or defen defense against our more Christian brothers and sisters. No, I actually do believe something. <laughs> and instead, instead to bear witness to the presence and authority of Christ himself, to point to Jesus Christ and see where that leads us. I challenge my students to write in a hundred words or so what the Bible is about. That is, if they tell people, you should read the Bible, they should expect people might say, oh, what's it about? And they should be able to answer that question. The same say, for example, I don't know, is the Hunger Games phenomenon alive and well in Canada? Okay. So I don't know if you've seen it or read it, but if, you, if, if, if a kid says to another kid, you've got to see the Hunger Games, the other kid's going to say, what's it about? And the first kid is going to give them an answer in 100 words or so. We need to be able to do that. Some of my students, when I give them that assignment, will say the Bible is about faith, or about God, or about finding meaning, which I suppose it is. But that's sort of like saying the Hunger Games is, Hunger Games is about life in the woods. <laughs> the best answers don't actually begin by saying the Bible is about this or that. They just tell the Bible's story. And some do that, some of my students do that quite adeptly in just a paragraph or two. Those paragraphs require making choices, of course. They generally won't go first to Proverbs and Leviticus. They will go to creation and Exodus to Jerusalem and Babylon to Bethlehem and Calvary. 
they will begin not to explain, but to proclaim, to tell what God is up to in the world. And that is just what the world needs to hear from us. We don't speak to the world about authority. It's not their question. Rather, like Christ, as audacious as it is, we speak with authority. Authority is not arrogance. It is confidence. It is not proof. It is witness. It does not compel. It invites, as the gospel always does. Luther wrote in his 1522 Ascension Day sermon on, Psalm, on Mark 16, Faith, it's on your handout. Faith compels and forces no one to the gospel, but leaves each person free, opening the gospel to each. Whoever believes, believes. Whoever comes, comes. Whoever <coughs> remains outside, remains. For the Lord commanded the disciples to do no more than preach the gospel, and that's what they did. They preached the gospel, but they hear those who would, they did not say, believe, or I'll kill you. <laughs> German theologian Konrad Schmidt speaks similarly of the Bible. One of the most essential characteristics of the Bible, he writes, is that its texts do not present their concerns with force, but desire only to be heard. That's the lesson we have to learn and the story we have to tell. The, the authority for our story is not defined or imposed externally. It resides in the story itself. It resides in Christ, of whom the story speaks. We just bear witness. It may be our best and correct only vocation as theologians. So what will it mean to bear witness? There's actually only one requirement for bearing witness. You have to tell the truth. Witnesses are not marketers or sales reps. Theirs is not to interrogate or to judge. They seek not to convince or to entertain. They simply tell the truth. Now, what's the truth about Jesus? That question brings us back to our earlier observation that there are many Jesuses. And of course, that's true already in the Bible, even without considering what subsequent tradition and culture has done with this humble carpenter. But to get it right, I think we have to work backward from the later confessions of the New Testament in John 1 and Colossians 1, the word was God, John 1. In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, Colossians 1. True, the disciples didn't know that on the day they were called. And neither did the crowds when they rushed to hear Jesus and receive his touch. Some throughout recent history will even debate about the early messianic, messianic consciousness of Jesus himself. But make no mistake, if Jesus' followers had not come to see the fullness of God in this man Jesus, we would have no New Testament and no Christian faith, for nobody thought what otherwise would have thought it was worth writing this stuff down and passing it down from generation to generation. John got it right. These are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through him, through believing, you may have life in his name. So we tell the story because it's life-giving. But to let it to be so, we must tell the truth. We don't need to pretty up the story or defend it. We don't need to fix its inconsistencies and its variety of perspectives. 
The story can take care of itself, thank you. We merely bear witness.